Welcome, uh, our appreciation class uh, for fall of 2017. Okay, so this is just the introduction for talking about classical Greece. I decided for this unit to just simply make a short video to, as a supplement, the two videos already from, from last fall, just to emphasize, make sure we're clear on some what's the most important information you need to get out of this. So one of the things I noticed when I was re-watching those videos is that there was a little bit of some information that I didn't put in clearly, and that was talking about the relationship between the, the Greek and the general Mediterranean world sense of freedom compared to uh, the Persians. As the Persian Empire expanded and they reached to Asia Minor and they got to the Greek city-states, they were kind of confronted by these sort of, from their eyes, almost anarchic uh, Greek city-states and eventually they were defeated by them and we look back at that today and we see it as like the winning of the modern world right that like the greek ideal of freedom was what won but it's important to remember that in some ways the greeks represented a very novel new idea about the freedom of a human individual in society and that that in some ways was was going to lead to some things that we see in the modern world but in other ways the Greek idea of freedom was a very old, ancient kind of way of life, and that their model of living was in many ways a more traditional and older model than the Persians. The Persians who were working on kind of, a, a, like I said, a top-down uh, empire model, whereas the Greeks were living a city-state model, which is a very similar kind of way of thinking about the relationship between the individual and the state as what the ancient Sumerians or the ancient Akkadians lived by. So in some ways the the Greek victory was both a victory for something the potentially new and novel and potentially modern ideal of, of human individual freedom, but at the same time it was also the victory of a very old fashioned and traditional model of uh, organizing society. So I wanted to emphasize that. And I also wanted to say that something I wish I'd covered a little bit more on those those two lectures I did last time was just the basic idea of um, of the golden age, you know that um, whoop, I'm back one when um, one of the things I talk about here in this in the next lecture is how did we get from archaic to classical and where did this classical uh, periclean age come from and in some ways this is a bigger topic than just in Greece because it's the topic of the golden age. When we look at art history and when we look at history in general, history looks like a lot of period of conflict, a lot of period of slow transitions, but also then punctuated by these brief moments of culture that kind of seems to bloom and flower. Um, and just in certain moments, we have all these things coming together and we have great wealth, but we also have great art and great literature uh, and just an explosion of science and philosophy all in one place. Um, Periclean Age Greece is the epitome of this, but also uh, the Renaissance, in especially in Northern and Middle Italy, um, but other periods as well, you could look to and say, here's this kind of moment, it was kind of a golden moment. And one of the questions is always why? And, you know, in this particular case, we can look and we can see a number of reasons. And I go through those reasons in the lecture, talking about in what ways Greek culture was different and in what ways it was just an economic situation that, you know, the, the commerce of the Mediterranean was becoming more important. And, but at the same time, there's like, when we deal with these kind of issues, it's the question that can never be fully answered because it's always, it's a combination of all these different reasons why. And, but also in some ways, it's just any, any one thing can't explain it completely. So there is no complete reason. Um, but it's an important thing to always ponder because, because especially in terms of art, because art is so dependent on uh, these moments when, when culture seems to flourish. Okay, I also wanted to just briefly talk about uh, what were the things you must, you should know the most out of the next two lectures. Uh, one of the things I cover, um, and you should make sure you know quite well, is architecture. We talk about the three orders that would be the Doric, Ionic, and um, 
the Corinthian. You need to make sure that you know those three pretty well, how they're different from each other, um, and specifically how they are different from each other in terms of details of architecture, such as uh, columns, capitals, uh, bases. Uh, you need to make sure you understand what entablature is and what an entablature frieze is, uh, and then how um, each of those systems use the entablature frieze. And you need to know um, specifically in terms of the Doric what a metope is and what a triglyph is. Um, also, you need to know what entasis is. I explain that pretty well in the next lecture, and as well as what uh, fluting is. And then when I'm talking about sculpture and the transition to classical Greek sculpture, you need to know what contrapposto is. Um, and then later on in the lecture, I start talking about uh, the difference between uh, Hellenic and Hellenistic. And this is the last thing I'm going to say for this lecture right now, or this part right now, which is just to, um, I didn't, I don't think I explained the difference between Hellenistic and Hellenic quite as uh, well as I could have. So I'll sum it up this way. In general, Hellenistic sculpture tends to be more dynamic than Hellenic, more active, um, more expressive, you're showing more signs of emotion, especially like a lot, a lot more willing to show negative emotion like anguish and pain. And um, but it also tends to be a lot more specific, a lot more willing to be close to the natural world. Um, in some ex instances, you could say actually a lot more realistic, like where the, the desire of the sculptor was to create something that looked like a specific real world thing. A good example of that would be the dying gall, where the dying gall is supposed to look like what a real dying gall looks like, rather than the ideal of dying valor, right, as a as a symbolic ideal, or this um, Alexandrian piece, uh, the beggar woman. Uh, and when it, when it says Alexandrian there, it means Alexandrian, but it's also Hellenistic. Um, another thing I want to say about um, the Hellenistic world, just for those of you who are really into history, is that it's the the conquering of you know Alexander, Alexander of Macedon, the conquering of Greece, and then later on the conquering of um, the almost the entire, well, all of the Persian Empire and beyond is a really, really important historical event. But it's also important to remember that the foundations of the Hellenistic world were set before, uh, set long before Alexander the Great, that like Greek colonialism, as well as Phoenician and Carthaginian colonialism and even Roman car colonialism, um, and this developing of just a general um, commercially connected and somewhat culturally connected Mediterranean world that was as much responsible for creating a, a world that was ready for a veneer of Greek culture to be put on top of it and that Alexander then coming in and conquering all of these places was important and then the establishing of all of these later post Alexander Hellenistic kingdoms were important but the the, a lot of the groundwork actually happened before Alexander, uh, so I wanted to be clear about that. And then I ended the very the second lecture talking about um, talking about Rome, and I think I don't need to add much about Rome. I think what I said there was pretty clear. Okay, so that's it. So you have two more to watch. Uh, the second one, unfortunately, is kind of long. All right. Uh, thank you. Bye.